Okay, uh, good afternoon everyone. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome you and first of all welcome our panelists to this first session of the conference. I am um, grateful to the organizers for asking me to moderate this panel and also to speak in this panel from the legal perspective. Session one is going to be on rules, principles and values of humanitarian action. And I will start with introducing our panelists. So the keynote speaker and the first speaker of this panel will be Jan Voigt from Caritas Internationalis. Uh, we also have Marek Stis from People in Need in the panel. And Junaid Mohamed from the Polish Humanitarian Action who is the head of the program for Syria. And my name is Dorota Heidrich. I represent the University of Warsaw. Uh, so I would now like to give the floor to Jan Voigt. Jan is going to talk about the um, rules, principles, and values from the point of view of an international non-governmental actor, Caritas Internationalis. Jan, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. So I work for Caritas Belgium, but Caritas Belgium, we are a member of the Caritas Internationalis Confederation. And this confederation counts 165 member organizations. So we are spread all over the world because yeah, we are depending, not completely depending, on the church. So wherever you find bishops, Catholic bishops, Caritas is present. And how does this thing work and how can we implement, in fact, the humanitarian principles and these values? That's what I'm going to try to explain to you. So, the church is an institute which is existing already for 2,000 years and always has been working for the poor and for the destitute people, also developed uh, hospitals, schools. So it's uh, an, an institute which is incontournable, they say in, in French, all over the world. Now, Caritas organizations, they are an independent uh, organizations within the church structure. How does this function? the National Bishops' Conference is handing, given the mandate to the National Caritas Organization to do humanitarian work. But not only humanitarian work, they also do development. They have uh, human rights, they work for migration, they work in trafficking. So they're working in very different domains, but notwithstanding that they do development, and sometimes this development could be linked to political motives, uh, they also respect the humanitarian principles. And in order to uh, achieve this, they are, together with the Federation of the Red Cross, together with Oxfam, together with Save the Children, together with the ACT Alliance, who are constituting the Steering Committee for Humanitarian uh, Response, the SCHR, they developed in 91, and it was in 93, in fact, they developed the Code of Conduct of the uh, International uh, Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent and NGOs. So they were at the, 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 the birth, in fact, they together developed these 10 commandments of uh, the, the humanitarian reflex, where it's already stated in principle four that we shall endeavor not to act as instruments of uh, governments, where they uh, highlight the humanitarian imperative where they highlight the principle of impartiality. So that was the first step, in fact, and it came in very handy because the church was confronted with the Rwandan genocide in 94, which was provoking quite a lot of problems within the church as such. Then the next step of, uh, to prove the commitment of these 165 agencies to the humanitarian principles came a little bit later. Um, Precisely, in fact, with, uh, in 2001, with 9-11, with the intervention of the, Afghan, uh, of the United States in Afghanistan, specifically also with the intervention, the not UN-mandated intervention by coalition troops in Iraq. And then they developed a quite uh, handy guideline at Caritas and the military, in which they told clearly that they abide by the uh, principles of impartiality, neutrality, that they uh, strictly re re uh, reject the idea of a humanitarian military intervention. For them, uh, for us, in fact, um, a humanitarian military uh, intervention does not exist. So that's also quite a very important point. 
And then uh, later on, uh, we reconfirmed this commitment by collaborating with the European NGOs uh, in the EU consensus on humanitarian aid, where once again we confirmed neutrality, impartiality, uh, all of these things, uh, the, the four principles in this EU consensus on humanitarian aid. And the last thing we did as a Caritas network uh, was to confirm this in an, an, a briefing paper that we wrote in 2014 on bridging the gap, in which already we demonstrated that governments do not re uh, respect, in fact, in their funding policy, this kind of uh, the, the neutrality and the impartiality and the independent nature, so not to act as instruments of uh, policy, of government policy. So that's uh, reconfirmed again. This is not easy to work uh, in a context with 165 or independent organizations, uh, which are working, if you take, for example, Caritas Lebanon. Caritas Lebanon is working in Lebanon, and uh, they do respect the impartiality principle. I can tell you that for the time being, they're very much involved in the relief operations for Syrian and Iraqi refugees. And more than 80%, I say more, almost 90% of their beneficiaries, they're Muslims. Same goes for Caritas uh, Jordan. Um, another thing that I could highlight maybe is uh, what happened lately in the Kasai in Congo. As you know, Caritas, the church in Caritas Congo is very, very important. It's almost a, a state in the state. Uh, it, the, all of the parishes, uh, some churches have been destroyed by the uprising of the Kamwina Tsapu and reaction of the army over there. And what we did uh, as Caritas Belgium is to monitor the situation and to install a kind of network whereby through SMS, uh, human rights abuses were centralized in Kinshasa and then um, yeah, we made this public. So the church at a certain moment they made public that 3,000 3, breaches of humanitarian rights uh, were serious breaches. So, but it was the church who announced it while Caritas was simply doing the job in trying to provide relief for this one point two million people displaced. So uh, it, it has a lot of interesting topics, but all of these independent organizations, they do respect for sure the impartiality principle, so no distinction, uh, relief according to needs. The neutrality principle, sometimes this is kind of a, this could constitute a problem, but we try to find our way around it. I can tell you that, uh, for instance, in Sri Lanka, there, the Catholic Church uh, was present with the people in the safe zone together with ICRC until the last moment. And we were, by doing that, we could do advocacy, but also silent advocacy towards the people in power in Sri Lanka. So, um, well, just to tell you that we try to live up to these uh, principles. And of course, one of the most important things within this Caritas Confederation network is that we work according to the principle of subsidiarity. So for us, we always work with partnerships. So it's the national Caritas, it's the diocesan Caritas, it's the parishes who do the job, assisted by other members of this confederation. And you see them, it's CAFOT, it's CRS, it's Stroker, Caritas Belgium, Secours Catholique. So, uh, uh, we are spread over all, all over the world, but in the first instance, it's also always the local Caritas who do the first response. I will leave it up there. I think that's it. Yeah. Thank you very much, Jan. Uh, okay, so I think that we have uh, in Jan's presentation, in the keynote speech, we have a lot of um, issues that have been raised. So I'm sure we are going to go back to these and we are going to elaborate on those issues further in the discussion. Um, I was asked by the organizers to talk about the legal perspective of rules, principles and values of humanitarian action. So I'm going to be short here so that we have enough space for discussion, but I'm going to point to a few things. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that uh, basically I believe that uh, from the point of view of international law and how international law regulates the conduct of states, but also non-state actors, we may differentiate between rules, principles, and values of humanitarian action. 
I would uh, say that the values of humanitarian action are these values that actually form basis for any uh, humanitarian action, but also uh, charity activity. So everything that is connected to respecting human dig dignity, to assistance to the poor, uh, to res but also respect to individuals, respect to differences in their beliefs and their cultures. Uh, I think that also the um, impartiality may be regarded as an as a value generally in bringing um, um, charity or bringing any kind of assistance to individuals that are in need. Um, mm, rules, I would say, refer more to the regulation that have a legally binding character. And I would uh, say that uh, they can be traced in uh, international humanitarian law, especially in those instruments of the international humanitarian law that are legally binding. And I would like to obviously point to the four Geneva Conventions of 1949 and the additional protocols. However, in the, um, as far as the conduct in uh, armed conflict is concerned of all parties, as you, I'm sure you're very, you are very well aware of that, there is more to that than just the four Geneva conventions. And finally, uh, the <coughs> principles uh, that um, can be called, uh, well, the principles I would say that have evolved in the time when humanitarian action was already in place and that relates to, so, so it, it is all interconnected, but that, that relates the most to what Jan has just said. And I would point to the four uh, fundamental principles that are recognized by all humanitarian actors. And I think there is no question about the recognition of those four principles. And as Jan mentioned, the principle of humanity, neutrality, impartiality, and independence are those that should be, that should guide each and every humanitarian action. Um, the issue here is that these principles, even though they are respected by all humanitarian actors, for some of the humanitarian actors, they would not be legally binding. Uh, that's obviously the question of the international community and of uh, international personality of actors that act in a humanitarian sphere. Um, mm, the conduct of states is regulated by international humanitarian law. The conduct of international governmental organizations to a certain extent might be regulated by the internal laws of international organization, but also they are composed of states and themselves international governmental organizations are subjects of international law. But there is a question of non-governmental actors, also a question of these actors that have not yet reached a status of state actors and are important for humanitarian action because for instance, this can be belligerents, insurgents, before they are by law, by international law, by international actors recognized as having international personality. So these fundamental principles, obviously we can add to them the principles that have also been included in some of those code of conduct that Jan has, that Jan has mentioned, so the uh, Red Cross and Red Crescent Movement Code of Conduct or the uh, SCHR, Humanitarian Charter, and Minimum Standards and Humanitarian Response. And actually you will find all those fundamental principles, most often more than four, so we would have the 10 that are in the uh, Red Cross, Red Crescent Code of Conduct or those that are basically repeated in the humanitarian uh, um, charter and the minimum standards of uh, SCHR. But the, the, these principles for non-governmental actors are voluntary. So they accede to these principles because they want to be part of the humanitarian field, so to say. Uh, they have their national regulations that would require from them specific actions, but when they act in an international field, it changes their position. Uh, for international non-governmental organizations, big international governmental, uh, non-governmental organizations, sorry for that, uh, like Caritas Internationales, I think there is no question that being an international actor, there is also a regulation that most often comes from the headquarters of the organization or at least from non-governmental components of international non-governmental actors that come from, as we call it, the north. So they bring certain standards that have been established and they are clearly established leading uh, humanitarian activities of non-governmental uh, actors. But there is also a question of non-governmental organizations that do not have that much experience as Caritas, for instance, or that come from national states and have not been able to uh, pursue their actions accordingly to these principles for various reasons. The one reason is that they do not have this tradition, but they do want to get into the humanitarian field to humanitarian action. Another reason may be that there are certain challenges to humanitarian action that do not always make it easy 
to go along these principles. Uh, the principle, just to uh, mention a couple of examples, the principle of independence. This is very much related to the problem of financing. International actors are financed, most often from independent sources. National non-governmental actors or governmental actors, when founded from governmental sources, obviously put independence into question. The issue of neutrality. Uh, I think that we also have representatives of, of the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement here in this, uh, in, the, um, in this conference, so I think I would be very interested in hearing your opinions about that. But the issue of neutrality is the, the, uh, sorry, the principle of neutrality is the most debated one, because humanitarian actors always face the question to which extent they can become neutral, especially if we have a situation of mass violations of human rights. You mentioned Rwanda. The question of Rwanda, the question of speaking about the genocide in Rwanda, is the question that I don't think that we have, that we can fully answer it, why humanitarian actors did not speak up. So we can give different explanations to that, but this is definitely, Rwanda was definitely a point like the conflicts in the former Yugoslavia, but there are numerous other examples in which humanitarian actors did not stand up to speak. Some humanitarian organizations were founded because they thought that with the existence, with the with the existence of some principles, but um, uh, norms being binding only for states, there must be a need to create internal regulations that will let those humanitarian actors to speak up. So for instance, if we go to Médecins Sans Frontières, the Doctors Without Borders, the organization, it was set up based on the belief that neutrality is not the best answer. That we have to speak about human rights abuses. Jan again <laughs> mentioned, mentioned, I mean, that, that's, that's, that was one of the, of the issues, obviously. I don't want to say that it was the only one. Jan mentioned that, uh, you mentioned that um, in, uh, I think, uh, when you spoke about uh, the Kasai region, you said that you offered the people to report about human rights abuses. But the reporting about human rights abuses or bringing human rights abuses to uh, debates on the international arena may to some extent also block access to the victims for obvious reasons, because uh, state actors are not very happy about the situation in which there is the policy or, or method of naming and shaming applied. So I think that these are the challenges to the principles. And as I said at the beginning um, of my talk here, uh, it's not, we are, we are not talking here, I think we are more talking here about the principles, not about the rules, if we treat the rules as legal, legally binding. Uh, I'm sure that will also come up in our discussion. There are different challenges for states in humanitarian action than for non-state actors, especially non-governmental organizations. There, are, there is a lot of criticism against international organizations of a non-governmental character and non-governmental <coughs> organizations that have a national character. I think maybe less than we had in the past, especially in the 90s after Rwanda, after the former Yugoslavia, after Goma, after Sierra Leone. So all that that was highly criticized, we've had some standards established. There are non-governmental organizations uh, initiatives like the Sphere Handbook, for instance, the newest edition of the handbook is trying to respond to the challenges of humanitarian action, but we still haven't found all the answers. We still haven't find, found all counter arguments to that criticism, and we know that challenges in humanitarian action uh, still exist. Uh, so I think I'm going to stop here, and um, as I want to leave space to the discussion, uh, to uh, give the floor to the uh, other two participants of our panel. Uh, but also, obviously, uh, um, Jan, I would be very happy if you could uh, answer some of the questions that I thought would be relevant to the issue of uh, rules, principles, and values of humanitarian action. And then I would like uh, also uh, the audience to have uh, enough time to bring uh, about comments and uh, questions. So the first uh, question that I would like to ask to uh, the uh, participants of the panel here uh, actually relates to um, the uh, issues that I have raised uh, in my talk here today. So I would like to know whether you think that the basic humanitarian principles uh, need modifications or are adaptation in today's humanitarian action. I would like to ask to reflect upon that question uh, in the context of uh, conflicts that, uh, conflict but emergency, humanitarian emergencies around the world generally that are recent. So do you see any need to modify the humanitarian principles or maybe 
to adapt them to the current, uh, currently ongoing crisis or the crisis that characterized the new millennium, not to go back to the 90s, but obviously I would be happy also to uh, listen to your uh, thoughts and answers uh, concerning the uh, humanitarian emergencies of the 90s. So I would like now uh, to, if I may, give the floor to Marek Stis and present um, his um, um, thoughts about the question and about everything that has been uh, brought about here, and then we will go to Junaid uh, with the same question. Thank you very much and good afternoon. Uh, very interesting hearing the both uh, both intervention. I have to agree absolutely that like issues of uh, impartiality and basic humanitarian imperative are unquestionable. Uh, so to say, I, I don't think we have to change the principles because they remain perfectly valid as they have been uh, formulated, but possibly we have to explain them in a better way and we have to be more flexible about the, uh, about the principles. Speaking from the perspective of uh, uh, an international uh, NGO and from the, from the uh, operational perspectives really, uh, we do more than 80% of the, of the humanitarian assistance in the conflicts or around the conflicts. So this is the, the, the main, main topic definitely, and particularly for work in the conflicts. The, the principles remain the, the absolutely guiding and life-saving uh, uh, framework for uh, us, for our colleagues, be it international, national colleagues, for our partners in the field. So there is nothing to change, there is nothing to, to question. And uh, we have to be also a bit critical in this sense and to, to see to what extent we implement the principles and uh, to what extent we are being seen and perceived that we are implementing the principles. And I think this is the crucial breaking point which is leading us to excess or non-excess, which is leading us to security or insecurity and the other issues. So this is, this is a very important element. And then I would like to mention a rather wider uh, the global dimension uh, we are living in the in the, in the past two decades in the, in the situation when the needs globally are uh, uh, exceeding all the all the records and breaking all the records we had it's caused by multiple factors obviously by the population growth by the growth in the number of the conflict by the climate change by the urbanization by the inability of the of the, the, the global the global community to 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 solve the conflict and to, uh, to diffuse the conflicts. Uh, but the, the gap between the going needs and the resources, which are basically going up as well, uh, but not so exponentially as the needs, uh, are leading us in the situation of, of ever widening uh, scissors, uh, where we are unable to catch up. So there's an opening gap, and this is proven by all the statistics, which are another topics of this, uh, of this panel, obviously. But this is uh, leading me, or leading others, to uh, basically rational that, that the current system is not enough. We have to bring new actors into the, into the system. That's what was the World Humanitarian Summit about, and what World Humanitarian Summit was quite miserably failing in bringing any, any answer the, to this, possibly, or hopefully it started up some process, but it didn't bring the, 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 the answers. We are always speaking about the new actors uh, and that we have to broaden the, the, the humanitarian partnership. We are speaking about the new, uh, new uh, n n n n countries, new governments. We are speaking of non-state actors. We are speaking about the business. We are speaking about the, about the local actors. We are also speaking or not speaking possibly very much about the low, uh, role of the uh, recipients of the people we call the beneficiaries whose voice is really not heard at all in most situations. And the question is, do all these new actors who have to come into the game somehow, are they going to respect the same values? Is it fair that we impose these principles on them and telling them you cannot join unless you respect the, the principles? I don't think this is the way forward. So the, the flexibility to accommodate the new actors in the humanitarian aid, I think, is the way forward. And I think for me it needs some more flexibility into the principles and lo looking into these very core issues of the principles, which from my, my perspective is particularly the, the humanitarian imperative and is the impartiality. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you very much. Um, Junaid, uh, Junaid is a, uh, the head of the mission in the post-humanitarian action for Turkey and Syria program, so I think we will have a lot of yeah. uh, uh, interesting comments concerning the activities of humanitarian actions in Syria and ongoing conflict. Uh, sure. um, I don't know what you are going to say about yes. it, but the floor is yours. Yeah, first of all, I would like to say thank you to <coughs> uh, University of Forsa, NOHA, and Polish Humanitarian Action for organizing this event. 
I think it's uh, really uh, a pleasure to sort of you know speak in front of such a learned uh, audience. I would say, um, uh, representing Polish humanitarian action, I would say that our mission is to make the world a better place uh, by alleviating human suffering and by promoting humanitarian values, human values. Uh, and I cannot uh, agree more than by saying that humanitarian principles are basically irrelevant and also uh, they are imperative in the current circumstances more than ever. Um, uh, principles, uh, humanitarian principles are not mere uh, sort of values, but it provides access to um, uh, basic services, basic needs um, for to the people who are in need. Um, civilians, um, we are saying, in, uh, I, will, I will talk uh, about Syria context because I am working with Polish Humanitarian Action Mission in uh, Syria and Turkey since last uh, two and a half years. Um, five million peoples are, uh, people are displaced, uh, six, uh, 6.5 million people are internally displaced, uh, 0.5 million people are, uh, are living in areas which are besieged, and uh, 3 million people are um, in areas which are hard to reach. Um, schools are being bombed. Um, uh, humanitarian uh, actors are being targeted. Uh, hospitals are being uh, bombed as well. Um, civilians are not getting assistance to food. Uh, and our uh, voice as a humanitarian actor in the area is like we are educating for humanitarian uh, actors, their access to, uh, to, to the regions which are like hard to reach. And I think our perspective should be that uh, the assistance to food should not be linked to political uh, actions. Um, there should be ceasefire. Uh, uh, and and uh, we are talking about uh, UN Resolution 2165, which talk about um, allowing sort of, you know, cross-border humanitarian assistance. It should be renewed. Uh, I see there are a lot of political agendas behind, and there are uh, ifs and buts uh, as to how it will be uh, seen in the coming, uh, coming months. We are not sure if it will be extended, uh, if it will be continued for six months, or maybe it might uh, not be extended as well. Some, uh, some, some actors might veto it in the, in the UN, and then the uh, UN aid itself uh, will cease to sort of you know, go inside Syria. So we are talking about uh, these sort of imperatives. Uh, and I, I, can, I cannot say more than, uh, than this, that humanitarian uh, principle needs to be adhered, and they are as much viable, as much uh, imperative as they were in 90s or, 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 or a couple of decades <coughs> before. Yeah, yes, from a legal perspective, I, I do not think that um, the, the, the community of the international NGOs and also the community of the practitioners, I, I represent uh, Caritas Internationals in the Sphere Board, we're doing now a consultation and what you see is that there are like some 60 different organizations participating or members of these different organizations participating in the review of the Sphere Standards. So this community of practitioners, they abide by the, the principles. But lawfully, you, the, the, the problem of the people who do not respect the law, then we have to go beyond that. And there, for instance, last year, um, IOM has been accepted by the UN being a humanitarian actor. Now, if you look closely at what IOM is doing, sometimes they do not respect the principle of non-refoulement. So, in fact, this is a scandal. Since we are confronted with a lot of migration, so this non-refoulement, that means that you cannot send people back in, in a dangerous situation. IOM is doing this. IOM is transporting people who got stuck in Libya. They send them back to their countries of origin, and they have not examined if they run a kind of protection uh, issue in their countries of origin. So, it's, it's the UN who is uh, also, from time to time, shooting at uh, militias in, in Congo. So there's no difference in between the, uh, the, 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 the peace enforcing power of the UN, United Nations and the humanitarian aspects of the United Nations. I still remember uh, the, actual, well, um, the actual Secretary General when he still was the head of uh, UNHCR, uh, pleading for UNHCR that UNHCR was also respecting the four humanitarian principles. Well. If you're part of the UN family, you, you're not part of the, the, you're not respecting the principles. So it's impossible because they have a political agenda, they have a security agenda. So, and then if we go further to the, 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 the elements that constitute this international uh, humanitarian uh, community, which are our own countries, then we see that 
Every time we have a new Minister of Development Aid and Humanitarian Aid, I have to explain him that humanitarian aid cannot be used as a lever to, for a security agenda or for, nowadays it's migration. So no, humanitarian aid, it's just helping people who are in, in a difficult situation and that's it. You cannot use this. And if you see now, um, the ODI has been, uh, is publishing now three studies. Uh, about exactly so the the, the respect of the humanitarian principles by donors. Uh, the, the first study they made, and the idea was in fact to investigate on the attitude of China towards humanitarian principles, to the attitude of Saudi Arabia uh, versus the humanitarian principles. But the first country they investigated was the UK, because with the Brexit they also see that more and more the UK development aid will be, uh, humanitarian aid will be handed over to the military. It's going to the business opportunities. And also here, ECHO, uh, two weeks ago we received a quick note from the representatives of the Belgian government from humanitarian aid that ECHO want to discuss in COHAFA the fact that ECHO would be able to contract directly uh, mobile money providers, uh, the cash assistance because that would be efficient, uh, because that only could, uh, of the overhead, that would uh, gain them with something like 5% on, on the overhead. But these people work for profit. So we are non-profit, humanitarian aid should, should be non-profit, uh, th these activities. So if I would like to change some of the principles, I would like to insist, in fact, on the, first of all, the non-profit character of humanitarian assistance, and then a second thing as well, so Professor Bragg, I, I did not completely agree with you on the access, so giving people access to the services because we cannot have access anymore. For me, this, this is uh, a kind of a, a, a dangerous situation. So what for Caritas is very, uh, very important is the proximity with, this, with our beneficiaries. If we, Caritas Lebanon, has to deal with, I don't know, 200,000 Syrian and Iraqi refugees in Lebanon, well, we send out volunteers to see how these people are living with the little money they receive from WFP or from UNHCR. We try to seek to a system complementary whenever they have problems to pay for the education of their children. We try to give them a little bit, help them with the transport for the education for the children. If they are confronted with serious health problems, we try to provide them with the necessary money to, to provide these health uh, services. So this proximity has to remain. If we give up proximity, if we do assistance or on a distance like Nowadays, a lot of countries are killing on a distance. If we continue doing assistance on a distance, well, the soul of humanitarian assistance gets lost. And that's something that we have to avoid. Uh, thank you, Jan. I think that there were, uh, I would just like to point to uh, two things here that were uh, brought in uh, uh, two interventions uh, by Jan and by uh, Junaid. Uh, the issues of political interest and economic interest. Uh, states or intergovernmental organizations do have their political interests, security interests, economic interests. And I think that poses a challenge because obviously the world would be ideal if we had a situation that the Turkish government would allow non-governmental actors um, act with the um, potential refugees, those who are applying for asylum in Europe or in the transitional centers in Turkey. It would be ideal if the permanent members of the Security Council did agree to open permanent humanitarian corridors in Syria. It would be ideal if state actors treated humanitarian assistance as the, it should be treated. But, but this is not the uh, actual situation. So I think that, that that's why I was pointing to the difference between legally binding. I'm not saying that the legally binding rules are always obeyed. That's a different issue. But we have legally binding rules for states. Uh, and um, we don't have these for uh, non-governmental actors. But m very often it is so that these are the non-governmental actors that are pressing for observing these principles and governments not necessarily. And I think we see that in the United Nations. And I think also the uh, uh, issue that you brought about with the non-refoulement princi principles sorry, in uh, the IOM, uh, the UN is based of states that are supposed to be peace-loving states because that's the condition for exception, for, I mean, acceding to the organization. Uh, 
But what is going on in Australia? What is going on with the deal with Turkey signed by the EU? If the European Union is saying that they are doing it for the safety of the refugees, then it is obviously a fig leaf to all the policy that is being conducted here. And we understand political motives of that action. But Australia is a member of the West. It's the member that has always had a very specific uh, migration policy. But what it is doing with the with pushing back the boats of the people. The people are treated as illegal maritime arrivals, so they are not even called individuals. I mean, they, there's, there's a category, a legal category for these people, and they are pushed away from the territorial waters of Australia. Two places where they can apply for asylum, they live in horrible conditions in Nauru, in uh, Manus, in Papua New Guinea. The camps are now closing. But what is it? This is refooling the people to even in some cases to the territories where they can um, face persecution. So we have the international community composed of states that are not necessarily, I think, very often not acting accordingly to the humanitarian principles. Obviously, in the international community, there are states that have adhered and have been the proponents of those humanitarian principles. But I think that uh, the fact that, for instance, profit organizations are being included into the humanitarian um, world um, poses a threat, poses a challenge, but states and intergovernmental organizations try to be efficient. They also try to be, um, well, responsible to the donors. Um, okay, Marek, uh, would you Yeah, like I to... would tend to disagree what you said, Jan, okay. actually, because the, uh, I, I feel a certain monopolization of a humanitarian aid by the non-profit sector, and I'm coming fully from the non-profit sector. This is, this is my background, really, so don't take me wrong. I don't think this is fully right. And the example you gave about the uh, cash assistance is exactly a very good example why we should consider a for-profit sector as the excellent aid provider. Who of the uh, non-profit sector actors is in a position to provide a large-scale uh, cash scheme? Basically, we are not banks, and we will not be banks, and these are the banks who can issue the beneficiaries the cards, who can the most efficiently uh, run the, the system. And this is exactly what I was mentioning in my first intervention, that we have to be more open. We have to get rid of the vested in interest of the for-profit, uh, non-profit sector, because we are, even if we do it intentionally or not, we, we are, have the vested interest in this. We are being employed by the sector, and this is, this is, our, this is our job, these are our careers as well. So we tend to be uh, overly too protective, and we should deploy and employ much more the, the view and the position of the beneficiary. So who is the best actually to deliver to us? Is it, is it somebody from an NGO, from a UN agency, or is it my bank in here? If it's a bank, let's be it. So you hear more often this, this, this slogan, we have to let go, or you have to let go, like non-profit sector has to let go, and I think it's, it's got the, the, some substance. What I see with uh, some some cash delivery, I, I take an example, Mercy Corp together with MasterCard doing cash assistance in Ethiopia through the mobile uh, phone providers. There's only one mobile phone provider in Ethiopia, which is the state, it's state-owned. Uh, these people, they are registered, biometrically registered. So it was in Region 5, in the Somali region, which is a difficult region. So we have to also realize that if we do this step, we have to realize the consequences of this as well. Uh, another, in order to give cash assistance, uh, UNHCR registered, uh, biometrically registered, um, the, not only the refugees of, uh, in Difa, in Niger, but also the local population. So, well done, so everybody is listed now, so we can better control. And then, if we think further on how warfare will be done in a couple of years, then we, there's now a, a small movie which is turning around in Belgium. It's a kind of setting of this kind of uh, auditorium where suddenly a swarm of little drones are coming in and they work on facial recognition and they start killing individuals like this. So this is also the future. We are contributing in biometrically registrating migrants who will be recognized by Frontex, I don't know where. UN is collaborating with this, and we are promoting this. So I, I'm, I'm extremely uh, reluctant to participate. We, I, I know this, this is unavoidable. We are all linked, we are all profiled. But as a humanitarian uh, agency is contributing to this kind of effect, and then with the help, moreover, of private company, 
I, I, I still remember one Bangladeshi uh, who they were also talking about cash assistance. And his reply was, yes, you help individuals, but you destroy the community. And so we have to be absolutely, I know that the numbers are enormous. I know this, but if we are turning people who live in a very communal system and we turn them into individuals who also have their own bank accounts and things, this has consequences for the rest of their lives, for the rest of the community. And, and that, those are considerations that I'm, I'm taking into account and not simply trying to, yeah, like ECHO is doing, ECHO should not, ECHO cannot contract a private uh, provider, a private company to do the provider, we can do so, or the UN eventually can do so, but we need a kind of a guarantee that there is a kind of humanitarian reflex behind it, and it has to remain in the humanitarian domain, not becoming a business. Thank you. Uh, there was one more thing that uh, was brought about in the previous interventions and that these are the new actors and the question about China. I think this relates uh, to a large extent to what you've just said about some, some guarantees concerning the participation of these countries that do not have a very good record of human rights uh, observance and um, that, that, that's a question because what do we do if, if there is money that is there to help? Do we take money from all the sources, all the possible sources? Does it, is it, is it, is it putting into question those principles that we are talking here? And actually, uh, maybe I'll ask one more question and then we'll take a round of yes. questions from the audience. So I was wondering uh, whether you, what would be your comment uh, about the issue of impartiality and neutrality in situations of mass violations of human rights? Do you think that there is, I don't want to call it a threshold, but do you think that there is a moment when, depends on a non-governmental actor, on humanitarian actors, some actors speak about human rights violations regardless of um, what the others do. But there are still some that try to stick to the issue of neutrality and impartiality in situations of human rights abuses. And do you think that maybe that should be put to question or um, I don't know what your opinion would be, whether you think that these uh, situations of mass violations of human rights actually put into question the principle of impartiality and neutrality, those two out of the four uh, fundamental. Junaid, would you like to start? Uh, well, I mean, uh, uh, one yeah. comment from, uh, mm -hmm. from the previous discussion was uh, we started talking about access issues, I think. I just I have one comment on that, mm -hmm. that uh, access is a very vital uh, sort of key to, to ensure hu uh, humanitarian principle. If access is sort of uh, uh, denied, then the humanitarian principle, you are talking about humanity, you are talking about mm -hmm. neutral that neutrality, impartiality, you, can, you will never be able to sort of you know, monitor that. There would be definitely, you will have mechanisms like remote monitoring, you will have systems and procedures in, in place, but I would agree with Jan that if access is denied, then for sure these uh, humanitarian principles will be sort of, you know. So uh, I just want to say that humanitarian access is going to be the topic of the next session, so I'm sure <laughs> yeah, you're yeah, going yeah, to. Yeah, sure. So that, that, that uh, yeah. was my, uh, my point. Mm -hmm. But uh, 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 coming back to your question on impartiality and neutrality, I would just say that uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, the, the, I mean, from the international NGOs perspective as well, uh, in any scenario, I will talk about Syria uh, case as well, it is imperative to stick to the neutrality and impartiality and not to compromise on that. Even if there are mass violations of humanitarian rights, uh, uh, as I told you, uh, inside Syria, uh, access is not being granted. There are areas which are besieged as well. But then there are armed actors as well. If you compromise on any of the, uh, of the, of the values, impartiality or neutrality, your whole uh, um, uh, sort of, you know, uh, intervention or your whole uh, um, uh, activities will be, will be sabot uh, sabotaged. Um, because uh, today you are working in one area uh, which is governed by an armed group and maybe if you compromise on any of that uh, values, maybe impartiality, you will be good for a couple of days. But if the area of influence is, changes, mm -hmm. you are gone. So, uh, and, and we are talking on, on, uh, on uh, we are coordinating with OCHA uh, in Turkey Hub uh, and uh, this is one of the key, uh, key um, discussion points we always make that we, we have, uh, as an international organization, the, the, the actors which are working inside Syria and in Turkey, we have to stick to these principles. We don't have to compromise on, on them. If we compromise, all of us will be in trouble. 
Uh, inside Syria, we have joint operating procedures, which are agreed, they were drafted in 2015. Uh, they are basically guiding, uh, uh, the, the, the guiding principle are international humanitarian laws mm -hmm. and also the humanitarian principle. And basically, uh, in 2015, this was agreed, all the organizations uh, uh, will work inside Syria or in, Tur in Turkey based on those principles. If any one of them will be, we will be pushed to sort of compromise on any of them, we will not be able to sort of work. We will, mm -hmm. we will, we will stop working there. And, and, and there is no second question uh, about that. As I told you, if any aid worker compromises on any of the, the values, then the other organizations who are even rigid, they will be say, okay, there is another organization, he is, they are supporting us, or they are flexible. Why are you, you not flexible? So it will create troubles for all of us. So, uh, yeah. Marek? I tend to disagree. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, something you, you described about Syria, maybe yes, but I think this is a very contextual debate. I can, I can bring an example of Mount Sinjar in the northern Nineveh province, uh, where the, 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 the Yazidis have been uh, encircled by the, by the uh, Islamic State forces and massacred simply. Uh, then how can you be independent in such a situation? Who of the implementing organization, aid providers in Syria, were truly independent facing the, the ISIS massacres? Yeah. None of us. I cannot, I cannot agree. So I cannot take the full set of principles and say that, that they are applicable to each and every situation. Mm -hmm. we, we cannot, we cannot uh, uh, simply find a, a blueprint. And the, the Sinjar situation is something I will always remember from the, from the previous, previous past. And we can, we can discuss various other, other contexts. But I think we have, we have really to look into when there are situations of the, of the massive violations. The protection principle mm -hmm. is overriding the whole approach to the situation and this life-saving, whatever means it takes approach mm -hmm. is the paramount one for me. And deploying and allying with the, the, with the military, uh, military objective to, to get rid of a force which is, uh, which is so destructive and so killing as uh, some of these non-state actors or even state actors mm -hmm. we, are, we are meeting. I don't think this independence principle sticks mm -hmm. in these situations. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Jan? Yeah. Let's remain in, in the north of Iraq, uh, because there, WHO, they hired a private medical company to do the work. Uh, nowadays, uh, today, there's an article in The Guardian, I think, about the, the massacres that have been performed by the Iraqi army, because there was no protection, because they simply were giving medical services, but they were not protecting these people, because they were private. They only were accounted for so many operations, so many this, so many that, but no, no, no protection mandate. So, uh, well, that, 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 that's on the level of right. Of course, on the level of the advocacy you're speaking out about human rights, even MSF is very, very, well, I worked for 15 years with MSF, so, and I'm still a member, so we, we are very careful to speak out. It's very factual, we will never point the finger to that party or that party is responsible for that. So that, that's one element. Same goes for Caritas Sri Lanka, who were immediately advocating towards not only the international community, but also towards the government about what was happening in the famous safe zone where people got slaughtered. Uh, now Kasai. So it, th there is a possibility to do this kind of advocacy. Sometimes it's silent advocacy, sometimes it's in the media. The only reflex that we always have to make is to what extent do we put our people on the field in danger. That's whenever the communication department at Caritas Belgium wants to make a communication, I try to put my feet together with our local national partners to see to what extent he can remain, that he, gain, that he remains on the spot to assist these people. So once again, it's about access, even for partners. So we have to be careful when we testify, we have to know how to testify it. But in the past, uh, what happened in when the Taliban took over Mazari Sharif, uh, uh, what happened in Sierra Leone, uh, at that time I was working for MSF, but we were recording and recording and recording, but at least these victims we, we owe them the dignity to take their stories, and we would enlist their stories. And then we would hand them over to Human Rights Watch, or Amnesty International, or, or, or another human rights organization. Not immediately, not to be 
pushed out because of that. But afterwards, it 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 was it came in. Yeah, it, it could go to the International Criminal Court, but. As you know, the, 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 the big perpetrators of uh, human rights abuses, they do not appear yet for the International Criminal Court. That's, that's, that's politics. That's <laughs> politics. Even if we have a judicial institution, politics centers. Uh, okay, I think it's time to take uh, comments, questions from the audience. Uh, any interventions are welcome. So maybe we will do it this way, that first we will take a couple of comments and questions. If uh, you want to ask them and, and, and then uh, you will have time, each of the participants will have time to um, uh, answer. Uh, any comments or questions? Thank you very much for uh, those interesting presentations uh, and I would like uh, to thank uh, Marek, who is also a colleague of mine, uh, for uh, sharing that uh, the overriding principle is the protection and that it defines whatever we do on the ground. And uh, from my perspective as an aid worker, uh, I would like to, uh, to bring up my voice because there's a lot of students who will become the, the future uh, uh, humanitarian aid workers in some years from now. In current emergencies we are working in Iraq, in Syria, in, uh, in, in other places, given the difficulties of placing, for instance, international staff on the ground where it's needed the most, meaning where the people who are suffering are present, we are very rarely seeing a local partner, an entity, a grassroots organization that does not have a political uh, or any other belief and perception. Let us take the case of Syria. In the areas under control of opposition, I would say 95% of the local grassroots initiatives have their own beliefs. And if this would be happening in Poland or in Czech Republic or elsewhere, we would be facing exactly the same situation because otherwise, can you imagine you would not um, allocate the feeling of fault, uh, the feeling of guilt to a party to the conflict that is slaughtering civilians in front of your eyes. The sense of right and wrong that is something equal amongst us is something also that is telling us what is good and what is bad. And from this perspective, the overriding principle is to protect the civilians, is to release uh, them from the suffering, provide them with necessary aid to save their lives and health and restore their dignity. And whatever aid we are doing as a process of giving them back dignity, it needs to give back the recipient the autonomy it had before the crisis occurred. Because whatever technicalities and measurements and, uh, and quantities you look in your school books, uh, uh, within humanitarian aid concept, at the end of the day, any aid process can be judged and should be judged whether it extends and returns back autonomy of the recipient. And this is to me more important than DIC criteria, etc., because this is thinking about the well being of uh, another human. And so I would like to disagree with a colleague of PHO because. As it was said, the most important principle from my point of view, I spent 14 years in the field working in countries ranging from Chechnya, Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, and so many more, is the protection of a civilian. And quite often, by mere fact that we are present on the ground with a population that is suffering, is putting us in a situation that we are becoming a difficult witness. But since having an international uh, presence by being international organ organization, it also gives us space by our mere presence to protect some of the people because we are more difficult to be kicked out or erased from the map. So just to finish this prolonged comment, to everyone that is currently studying humanitarian aid, I wish you and I suggest that you never forget that you have to do all your best to push to be on the ground. Thank Whatever you. it takes. Thank you.
Thank you very much. I think we have space for one more question. Hi. Um, so I'm Laura. I'm the head of programs for PA here in Warsaw. Um, my question is quite practical. I sense a bit of um, uh, maybe discussion or controversy around the idea of cash and private sector uh, companies who would be contracted to distribute that. Seeing as we're talking here with NOHA students and the close link that was mentioned before between NOHA and ECHO, um, and the way that ECHO is now aiming, I believe this year, for 60% cash assistance, and they've even amended the dreaded single form to include a multi-purpose cash result uh, this year. I wonder if we could talk a little bit about how we perceive this idea between us as humanitarian actors knowing what we're doing and thus trying to exclude private companies who are actually, I think, in some ways, uh, and I possibly Jan would want to answer this, um, in some ways better uh, positioned to distribute cash. Um, I was uh, part of cash distribution projects in Afghanistan. We are now par, uh, moving towards a more cash-based approach in all of our missions. And um, I don't, I, I just would like to hear a little bit more about how you perceive that move, because it is a new a development in the humanitarian sector, and it's something we can't afford if we still want money from donors. Thank you. Okay, uh, just one short comment from a perspective of an academic. Um, and that relates to the comment about the protection principle. Uh, well, I would like to say that from the perspective of an academic dealing with international law, international organizations, and the international system, I think that uh, putting so, I mean, I understand your point, but putting the protection principle so much above the other principles and taking it as a leading principle can lead to situations in which NGOs, non-government electors can be easily kicked out. I mean, for instance, the Sudan under Omar al-Bashir, I think it's a very good example, and it was not before because of the actions of, of NGOs, but because of the action of the ICC and bringing the indictment of Omar al-Bashir to ICC, whatever we think about this indictment. There was a very short, it was, I mean, a decision that was made by the Sudanese government was quite effectively uh, executed, I would say. But this is just to point out that if you look at it from the point of view of international system and what non-state actors can and cannot do in the international system, I think this brings about a different perspective of the issue. But that's just a, a quick comment. I think it would require more discussion, which uh, probably we won't have uh, space to have today. Uh, so, uh, okay, uh, Jan, would you like to take the comments and questions, or especially <coughs> the question that was directed? Uh, yes, there was the one question of the root cause, and then uh, also about the protection. Well, um, of course, if you talk about Burma, the Rohingyas, but the other conflicts as well, but, uh, and, and then also about Palestine. Then immediately you come up with uh, the distinction of the world in between Islam countries and, and the Christian Western world or whatever. And what we've been seeing lately is that, um, specifically because they have a lot of money, um, the, the United Nations system is, has started to court, in fact, Islamic donors. Um, there are very important Islamic donors. Turkey last year, they accounted for six billion. So they are way up in the top 10 of humanitarian donors. Saudi Arabia, of course, with what's happening now, we do not know very well, but Prince Tal Talawel bin, I don't know what, but uh, this very rich person, well, he was shifting towards uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates. Uh, yeah, very important. Um, humanitarian funding that would be available. I know that from this Bin Talwal Foundation uh, Save the Children, they uh, accepted money to uh, build uh, humanitarian uh, practice schools, uh, about 10 of them. Mercy Corps worked uh, together with them. Um, from the side from Sphere, we saw that since the crisis in uh, Syria, uh, we had something like 30% of uh, the people consulting the Sphere Handbook were Arabic speakers. So we, we were advancing, in fact, in a way to have a big humanitarian family, at least exceeding in, in, the, in the Islamic world, which were more and more abiding with the humanitarian principles and not only thinking of 
um, being in favor of the Ummah, uh, the global Muslim world. So it, 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 it's starting. Um, we do not know to what extent it will be again reduced now with Mohammed bin Salman. But um, at least th this existing, I can tell you that uh, Caritas Jordan and Caritas Lebanon, they accept Muslim money from, from the Gulf states in order to assist 80% of Muslims. So, but the UN, uh, last year I saw uh, Stephen O'Brien, the former head of Unochan, and I, I told him, uh, since we were confronted with this famines, uh, man-made famine, uh, I told him, but we know that in Somalia, Turkey is playing a very important role in humanitarian relief. And now, lately, we, we've seen that in the Al-Shabaab regions, supplies are coming in. But Western organizations are not allowed to put supplies at Al-Shabaab because that's support to terrorism. But other uh, donors are doing this. So I told him, but why can't OCHA and together with the Organization of Islamic Conference, can they put on their website the common things that they do in Somalia, the common things that uh, Islam uh, of Gulf countries are doing in Yemen or in other, or in, for instance in Palestine. So, and, and this is, he told me that, uh, well, they do not respect uh, the principles and they are, uh, and this and that. But you can see if you go to the contributions of OCHA, uh, Turkey is not appearing. And of course, they, they, they are a little bit reluctant of to work together with the United uh, Nations system. So they're not very keen on doing multilateral work. They prefer to work bilaterally. But if we start to realize that this humanitarian reflex is present in China with Confucius, in the Islam, in the Christianity, in all of, of religions, Hindus even, more difficult, but anyway. So in, in every religion it's possible, so that's why always we believe that faith-based organizations can play a very important role in impartial, neutral, uh, independent humanitarian aid. Thank you. Uh, Marek? Ah, on, on the cash. Oh, sorry, on the I'm sorry, on, on, yeah, on the cash. Now, of course, um, we, I've been confronted also very times with uh, the difficulty of assisting people in uh, urban settings, um, for sure. There's a lot of good things happening with cash, but I, I'm always subscribed to the discussion groups of the CALP, eh? the Cash and Learning Pro. Last week, they were discussing about how to get around uh, the problem of the black markets. So we, we know, as soon as we go on... on in work in a country, and especially when we work with an institutional donor, we have to exchange our money uh, according to the official rate, which is three times, ten times less than on the black market. Now, in these discussion groups, which is constituted of the finest brains uh, working on cash, they were trying to find ways around, in fact, the sovereignty of a country because they're trying to find ways, in fact, to pay in black. <laughs> so in order to try to, to, to take away, in fact, the, the, the control of, of a government on the financial, um, their financial, um, how, how do you call it? Their financial st structure, in fact. So we have to be extremely careful. Sometimes it goes too far, especially also with the eight coin, uh, people believing in Bitcoin, uh, and then they want to transform this to the eight coin. We do not know who will be governing these computers who do all of the calculations and enlist every transaction in the world. This is 80% of the calculations of the Bitcoin are performed in China, in big uh, computer firms. But there is no government beyond that. It's not government, it's the computer. So are we handing over the sovereignty of our states, of, of, of the, the, the financial means of a state? Are we governing, all, all, or the rest of all of our contracts, are we handing this over to the cloud? I'm, I'm, I should be, so that there are some aspects which are unavoidable, but other aspects that we have to think twice, especially about the, the, the registration of our beneficiaries, so these are, uh, CALP has already done this kind of 10 principles on the protection of beneficiary data. Uh, ICRC has lately also produced a big booklet, but easy to read about the protection of all these new technologies. But we have to be careful. And the sovereignty of states with social media, that's something 
okay, maybe we, do, we choose a world in which we don't have states anymore and we have a kind of supranational, I don't know, uh, artificial brain running us. Maybe that will happen, but for the time being, I'm a little bit reluctant. Thank you very much. Jan, uh, Marek? No, I have to agree very much. <laughs> so we have a very consensual end of the end, end of the debate. I think the issue with the particularly with the eco cash guidance is that they are promoting this one size fits all approach, which is a nonsense. It has to be contextual. In some uh, some context, uh, possibly Eastern Ukraine, when we have been engaged heavily, this made a very good sense. It has never been implemented, unfortunately. Uh, in some context, it does not make sense. But in principle, I would like to repeat what I said: that bringing a bank as a cash uh, as, a, as an aid provider is perfectly enough, given the fact that we are aware of all these uh, traps and pitfalls, and given the fact that non-profit sector is possibly the best guardian that we don't fall into these uh, uh, pits, and particularly for the selection of the beneficiaries, for the monitoring of the, of the final deliverance, and for monitoring the overall system doesn't slide away into some uh, commercial enterprise at the final end. So, yeah. Uh, Janine, would you like to comment on uh, any of the interventions? Yes, I, I just have one uh, small comment on the, the, the question related to protection mm -hmm. uh, issues as well. I'll just uh, like to sort of clarify that. I mean, starting from 1992 when PA started its intervention from, from Sarajevo, uh, I think we have worked in 44 countries and uh, sorry for that. So uh, we have worked in 44 countries, and the, the basic drive for us was basically need of the people. And we went to countries like, I mean, uh, we were talking in the morning as well, that countries like Sri Lanka, Afghanistan, Pakistan, we worked there because there was need. And we were, when we were there, we made sure that we stick to our principles of neutrality and impartiality. Of course, working in different regions, different countries, in my previous experience, in the current experience also, when we are working in Turkey and Syria, I will talk about the same context again because I'm 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 um, I'm working there for for last two and a half years. We have been advocating for a lot of protection issues. We have been advocating for areas which are neglected for the people as well. But then you have to draw some lines as well. When I started two and a half years ago, there were 50 organizations on on the ground, and now we are just left for, with just 10. I mean, we have to see where where was the problem. How, how we analyze that. So you have to draw lines. At the end of the day, if you, if you raise some issues and you are not allowed to work in that area and the people in that country will be deprived of that aid, so what good did you do? Yeah, I, 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 I mean, I, uh, apology, maybe I, my, some of my comments were taken a, a bit uh, strong. I don't say that we have to draw lines and we should not uh, say for uh, protection issues um, and we should not advocate for that. As I told you, we have been advocating. We are part of a, a lot of advocacy forums. Uh, but then, uh, again, I would, I would say, I would confess, yes, context to context changes. But uh, we have, as I said, we have to draw lines. And for us, the people in need inside Syria, they, are, uh, they, they, they should receive assistance uh, regularly without interference, without any issue. We see that we have some boundaries, we have some limitation from Turkey. We have started mission in Iraq. Uh, we see that from Iraq and Syria, uh, Turkey, we cannot operate. We are, we are seeing option in Damascus as well. So for us, uh, we will remain impartial. We will go for the people who are in need wherever they are. Uh, who, I mean, for us, who, I mean, there are areas which are like Sunni, which are Shia, which might be supporting uh, Assad regime, might be supporting, we, we are calling it like other arm uh, control, other arm groups control areas as well. But at the end of the day, we are the common people who are in need. So, uh, yeah, that, that's, that, that's, uh, uh, that's all I would say. I don't deny that we should not talk about protection issues, but for us, uh, we have to see priorities. Uh, we can, uh, it can be one of the priorities, but we cannot take it as a, a top priority uh, compromising on humanitarian principles. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay, I think we just uh, run out of the time that is uh, uh, foreseen for this session in this panel. So, um, I mean, for in this conference for session number one. So, uh, I just want to say that uh, definitely from the points of view that were presented here and also from your comments, um, uh, it is visible that there are, within the humanitarian field, there are different approaches to issues of uh, principles, values, and uh, uh, regulations or norms. And these approaches are not, do not question these principles. 
but it's about interpretation of, this, of these principles and also putting them in context with norms of international character, but also members of the international system. So depending on how you see the international system, obviously we all represent different backgrounds, you, we all have different experiences. Those of you who worked on the ground have a totally different experience than uh, uh, we have in the academia especially if we if if um, those of us who have never worked on the ground we probably cannot will never be able to understand the uh, situation of those who were working on the ground uh, but i think uh, it is what is what is important here and this is uh, absolutely obvious from this session is that we all agree that the fundamental uh, principles of humanitarian action must be upheld, and there is no question about that. So as I'm saying, it's only the question about, to a certain extent, uh, interpretation, but I don't think that this interpretation puts those principles into question. I think that we can all agree uh, here on that. So let me just uh, uh, finish with uh, a quote from um, an ultra statement on, on, on the fundamental humanitarian principles. Uh, uh, I think that if the humanitarian actors, I'm rephrasing it, it walk the talk, so if uh, the humanitarian principles are applied as they were thought about to be applied, taking together all of these principles, putting them together, then we will see the world of humanitarian action as we would like to see it. Thank you very much for participating in session number one.